Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number six of the Mongoose Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Frederick, our longer form being... Actually, could you... Uh, what's your full uh, YouTube channel name so people can know who you are? Frederick Voltaire Bassiat. Yes, and he described himself as a classical liberal in the Jeffersonian tradition. Is that correct? Yes. All right, so how are you doing today? Thank you for, for uh, coming on. Uh, woke up, and today is Thomas Jefferson's birthday and a good Friday for me. Oh, okay. Good Friday? Well, today's just been a good day. Oh, yeah, but like, good Friday was a couple weeks ago. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I could describe, so how would you then a bit more in depth describe your political philosophy? Let's see. I describe myself as a classical liberal, as Fritz uh, put it. Um, I believe in a uh, aristocratic republic as a form of government. I believe in a natural aristocracy, well, basically meritocracy, essentially. Mm -hmm. And also, I have very strong libertarian, strong austro libertarian leanings. Like, I was very influenced by Hans or uh, uh, the, liber the libertarian philosopher, the anarcho capitalist philosopher. Okay. And so, in a way, you sort of like want the ideal republic that maybe Jefferson envisioned of the sort of led by the gentleman farmers in like Virginia. Sort, yeah, more like the. Is more like the lead of this character. Like he spoke of a natural aristocracy that there's, it's these group of people, these group of intellectual are virtuous people that there be uh, that they be governed by um, by wisdom, as Jefferson would put it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So I would say, why are you a classical liberal then? If I could ask, what led you to believe that this is the this is a political philosophy that you think would be the best to implement in a society like the United States or in any country, I suppose. Well, well, let's see. Well, I'm an American. Mm -hmm. I'm, not too fond, I'm not too fond of monarchy that much because I think it's not part of uh, the part of the American culture DNA. I think Americans are more bred of a, a, a Republican government and as far as I can tell, this has been the best form of government, but I am fully aware of the dangers of democracy and <laughs> other things as well. All right. And people are thinking you're an atheist, though. <laughs> Somebody says you're a Freemason. Somebody says this. I love this. We've got ourselves a Newtonian atheist idolater level 36 Freemason here. <laughs> I'm not an atheist. I'm a Christian. Okay. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's something that I would genuinely say that's good on you. I, I don't want to be patronizing, but so often the people that claim to be like classical liberals, the people like Sargon, they're atheists. And it's like, so they really have no um, actual way to justify their system morally. Whereas like, even though they weren't explicitly Christian, Many of the founding fathers, at the very least, they believed in God or in some God that and from which a natural law or which in part of which a natural law that entailed people's rights, their natural rights came from God. And so there's actually some sort of, you know, basis supporting a classical liberal system, even though I still wouldn't call myself a classical liberal and in fact would be quite... Um, <clears throat> Uh, critical of even the vision of the founding fathers and the fact that I think it almost to me seems like a bit of a time bomb that the deeply Christian society that the founding fathers established or that already existed in America circa the late 18th century, although the secular government was pretty much fine so long as America was a deeply Christian country and as so long as, you know, 99% of the population were Christians, the problem is it had no way of addressing what happens once you get a uh, perfectly accepted social changes as happened in the mid 20th century when all the Christian morality disappeared. And now it seems that the classical liberal values existing in the country, countries like the US, Canada and the UK are rapidly being, you know, are rapidly deteriorating. Yeah, I... 
Yeah, this creeping nihilism. Just mm -hmm. um, I I think this is one of the failures of classical li liberalism because they never did really address that type of that type of. They didn't really address that type of society. How will they keep their society virtuous? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, and I think that that's sort of the core for, problem for me because, for many, you know, I sort of classify American conservatives and British liberals like so. Ben Shapiro and Sargon are both liberals, but you know, Ben Shapiro, even though he's not Christian, he's Jewish. He believes in God, and he's sort of the uh, he's a classical liberal in the American sense, and Sargon's one in the secular modern sense. The problem for both of them, of course, is that I think holding individual liberty as the highest value of society it doesn't really make sense to me, nor do I think it's sustainable in the long run. Because for me, liberty, individual liberty, is a means to an end, not an end in itself. If you make men free, okay, what are they supposed to do with their freedom? There's no way to say you know, okay, you're free to do whatever you want. Well, what do I do with my life? Well, we can't tell you that now. Okay. And it seems like people begin to start questioning any of these. Once people start questioning the moral, uh, you know, and social uh, mores of their society, they start saying, well, if I'm, if freedom's the most important value, then uh, <clears throat> why don't I just make, do whatever makes me feel as good as possible? And that's, in some ways, how you get the hedonism and consumerism of today. Yeah, just, um, I think, I just think, I think religion can impose a form of self-government on people. I think some type of traditionalism can really help to give mm -hmm. people a purpose, you know? Um, and it, go ahead. It's, um, like, I, I don't, I, I'm not really particularly fond of, like state enforced religion. I just think, I think it just kind of needs to be voluntary in a way. Well, in a way I've noticed this is that the countries that are the, um, there's even the joke by the new atheist, Stephen Fry, when he says like, apparently for uh, atheism to be, you know, atheism is stronger when you have a state church, because if you look at the state churches, like the state Lutheran churches in Germany and Scandinavia and the church of England, they are completely in, totally you know they have absolutely zero teeth and they basically are only a couple years behind wherever the rest of the secular society and culture is to the point where i don't i can't even really consider them christian churches anymore whereas if you look at like the southern baptists and evangelicals and the catholic church which have always been even the catholic church the influence it's had it's always been explicitly separate from any state government the, no government owns the catholic church and they have been the most resistant towards any sort of modernity or any sort of secular uh, encroachments on religion because when it comes to religion and the church and state i really don't care about religious influence about limiting religious influence on society or the state i want the i want churches and christianity to deeply influence as much of our culture and government as possible it's more the other way around i don't want the state dictating what the church is allowed to do and essentially that is something that medieval europe seemed to have where there was clear although there was clear separation of the the certain powers that the secular kings in europe and the church had it was still understood that Europe was Christendom, a deep was a explicitly Catholic, you know, civilization. And it had that without the Catholic Church being like an enforced state church as it would be like in a Anglicanism or Lutheranism. Yeah. Just for like for Americans and religion. Um in um in the Lexus I can never pronounce his name. Alexis de Tocqueville. Yeah, Alexis de Tocqueville, yeah. And Democracy in America, he did know that Americans were able to conflate liberty with Christianity, but mm -hmm. just that I think I just I think that statement is true today that that I don't think most Americans cannot imagine uh Christianity while in their country, out being a part of their influence of their culture. And okay. I mean, I think increasingly the people living in this country aren't, I mean, could they really be considered Americans? I'm not just talking about immigration. I'm talking about just the fact that so many of, you know, 
modern Americans just have no respect, it seems, for any of the values that their ancestors had in America. You know, it's like, <clears throat> it's not in the sense that the West's problem is not the influence of foreign cultures. It's the fact that the, we're like this first civilization that has an anti-culture. We're, we're the, like the whole self-hating, the whole Western civilization's evil, white privilege thing. It, it seems like the progressives have essentially succeeded in creating what can be cons called anti-culture. Mm, I, think, I think one of America... I think America is a unique case because I think it's like a, it's just basically an experiment in the middle class, just giving um, the middle class to rule or, or supposedly that they rule themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you read books like Coming Apart by Charles Murray, like there's just been like a very strong decline since the 1960s. Like the, mm -hmm. the, the decline of marriage, the decline of family, and since I'm black, um, mm -hmm. this, is, this is even- I'm yeah. sorry, you're gonna have to leave the stream I, now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just, Go ahead. Yeah, since I'm black and <laughs> this, is sort of, this is sort of accelerating in my community, you know, mm -hmm. black people are way more socially conservative than black people on paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, you even read stuff by Thomas Sowell that and I, I not to uh, go on a tangent for a while, for a moment, but I think it needs to be said that on this subject, um, the alt right probably would have very different opinions about the African American community if the African American community had the same values it did in 1940. Where actually, I think it, Thomas Sowell said um, in 1929, the Af the black unemployment rate was lower than the white one. You know, like the you know the um, Harlem Renaissance, the African American communities, like certainly there was a lot of issues in them, but I think it's I think you could probably attest to this, not the uh, not to the same level as today, because at least then the family was still intact. Yeah, and I think that that's sort of a, one of the sad things about the civil rights movement, where unfortunately it seems like um, the genuine good reforms of granting legal equality and then ending formal segregation, it seemed like it became lumped in though with the other social changes like uh, the sexual revolution predominantly, wherein any of the uh, benefits given, uh, any of the good that was done by the civil rights movement was completely canceled out by the fact that you had the destruction of the, tradi of the traditional family. <clears throat> Yeah, just um, just I kind of have like I kind of have like a negative view on people like Martin Luther King and and other leaders in the civil rights movement because I kind of just view them as crypto communists, to be honest. Wow. Oh, I, I thought for a second. Uh, so, um, would you say the same thing about Malcolm X, though? Eh, not really. He actually was more beneficial in the black community. I, I always find that interesting that there, there does seem to be a lot of, I've, I've seen a lot of African American, heard a lot of African Americans, like even ones that are fairly conservative say that they, they're they not the biggest fans of MLK, but actually liked Malcolm X more, even though, wasn't Malcolm X half white? Hey, hey, don't, don't, don't look. <laughs> don't don't look into it. Just don't look into it. Everybody got messed up family trees in the black community. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's. I always find it interesting. It seems to be something that um, is common. Of no matter what color you are, if you have any Native American blood in it, you think you're magic. <laughs> <laughs> that's like uh, a crypto communist. I think that's has some mm -hmm. validity to it. But uh, I think going back to classical liberalism, I think the question I would ask any conservative, any American conservative is they'll agree that this is something that happened in the mid 20th century and they would agree that it's bad. I would ask them, well, why did it happen? Well, let's see. Libertarianism, eh? I guess the first real philosopher that was able to secularize libertarianism was Murray and Rothbard. Like he just basically just took God. He basically took God out out of the equation, just leaving this is the system. Then, and this is the. And I think it's just sort of brought the current state of libertarianism, honestly. Mm -hmm. 
Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is a sad thing because I'm actually still, um, I was a much bigger fan years earlier, but still sort of a, a fairly big fan of Ron Paul. And it's, if Ron Paul type libertarianism, if the libertarianism of actual, like going back to a framework of a strict interpretation of the constitution, I might have disagreements with it, but at least it's coherent and it's not completely insane like modern libertarianism is where you have the uh, libertarian national convention where you have a guy like starts like a big fat guy stripped down to his underwear and start dancing around. Actually, guy... I know the story behind that. Like, oh, really? I, I, I actually have some respect for the guy because he the reason why he did that, because the libertarian party were are a bunch of frosters or leftist progressive status, essentially. Mm -hmm. Just I got some respect for that guy. That's why he kind of did that. Just to make so he was just really trying to turn the whole thing into a farce and bring the whole thing down. Yeah. Okay. I, I could I guess I could see that still ridiculous. Or when I think um I can't remember when Austin Peterson, I think it was, said like, you know, I don't think we need to like, yeah, I'm for legalization of drugs, but I don't think we should uh be uh, selling, you know, cocaine to children, and people booed him for saying that. <laughs> for even a, a saying that we shouldn't let we shouldn't legalize selling hardcore drugs to children. People said, "Well, that's too that's too oppressive." Ooh, that sounds like Pete Ghetto Ethics. <laughs> but I mean, my problem with libertarianism is the fact that it's just this mass obsession with liberty, the idea of liberty itself, wherein. Again, as, as I would say, my belief, or I think one of the things that forms traditionalism is, uh, in my definition, is it's the belief that morality should be the highest value of a society, that we shouldn't be striving for a free society, we should be striving for a moral, for a good society. And I believe that out of that will come a relatively high degree of individual freedom, because as I see it, a lot of, the way a lot of classical liberals would have described it is, well, we already, you know, the American Revolution is not fought to establish new rights, but to reassert the rights that we already possess as Englishmen. Because, you know, the British would, the English would always say, well, we have our, we have our um, concept of limited government going all the way back to the Magna Carta. And it's based on that tradition that, that we want these liberal uh, principles, not because we want to change everything. Like that's, that was, I think, arguably the problem in France where, they completely wanted to do away with the entire system. Whereas in after the English, the English civil war, the, Glo the glorious revolution, sorry, in the late 17th century was more to stop having a proto, you know, a crypto Catholic, um, a monarch trying to assert full control over England and trying to find leave, uh, end a century of vacillating between, you know, absolutist Catholic monarchs and Puritan, a puritanical Republican dictatorships under Cromwell. And then, of course, the American one was to reassert the rights that they felt were being denied by them. Um, the problem, though, is I think what you say then to con about countries that don't really have that tradition of you know, centuries of tradition of liberalism, like you could see that happened in Germany, wherein although Germany itself did have Germany's liberalism in the 19th century was substantially different, in my view, than in uh, the Anglo speaking world, because German liberalism was very tied in with German nationalism and desiring a unified Germany along the lines of a constitutional m empire, you know, harkening back, trying, it seems like trying to go back to mixing the Holy Roman Empire and the UK. But even then, obviously we could see, as happened in Germany after World War I, they didn't really take to classical liberalism too well, did they? Yeah, just... Rather sad that World War One really brought out the end of monarchy, aristocratic rule in Europe, and brought out <laughs> the horrors of democracy. To be honest, and I mean, this is the thing: is I'm not necessarily against republics themselves. It's more against the whole ideology of, but of you know, the thing that just like gets me so angry about people like Woodrow Wilson and uh, George Clemenceau and David Lloyd George. It's the sort of pathological assertion of we need to destroy this country's government and force them to become democratic for the sake of the world. And 
they essentially justified murdering and starving millions of innocent people to death just so they could and you know prolong the war several more months just so that the germans would revolt against their own government like the germans in 1917 and, er, and 1917 and 1918 were very much willing to sue for a favorable and even peace but the allies at that point the allies were the ones who continuously refused any peace treaty because they wanted to completely destroy the uh the german government because well quote it wasn't a liberal democracy and I think if you want to go a little more, I wouldn't even say this is a conspiracy theory because it's pretty, I think there's plenty of evidence for it that it was so that American bankers who were, had been investing and giving loans to the allies would actually make back their money. Oh, the merchant of death, the merchant of death thesis. Oh. Mm -hmm. Also, but democracy is peaceful though. When has it ever spread to another country peacefully? <laughs> When I don't know, ask ask the ask the dead men who thought that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's sort of my problem with neoconservatives, to, to be honest. That they just think democracy is just this wonderful thing that it should be spread all over the world when it's well, kind of garbage, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find I find your position then interesting that. So you you would still say that you're in favor of a generally a high amount of individual liberty, right? Right. And then, but under a, essentially a pseudo aristocratic republic, or not a pseudo, just an aristocratic republic, which I find fascinating. That, and again, I don't want to bring this into it, but interesting that you're African American and yet you know you're very much a fan of Thomas Jefferson, the slave owner. Why, why why would I care about that? Exactly. I think I, I just find it a little interesting. Um, but you're right. He, if, if you like his ideas, you like his ideas, you know? <clears throat> I mean, I, <clears throat> that's where I'm going on this. Is, or actually, do you have anything else, Dad? I like this dispute on misconceptions about Jefferson. Like, uh, he wasn't Rousseauian or Hosbian in any sense that he didn't really believe in, well, like he didn't really believe in the Rousseauian state of nature, or he had some disagreement with Thomas Hobbes. Like mm -hmm. I think his state of nature is more about stoicism that the state. Um, it was more the state of nature. Uh, his natural law theory was more about stoicism, if mm -hmm. anything else. Uh, I, find, I find that pretty interesting. I mean, I find it interesting. For I, I like thinking about it from my perspective because the philosophers that I've been philosopher I've been very much influenced of late is Hegel and to me in a lot of ways he seems to turn a lot of these classical liberals completely on their head like there's just something about regardless of what people think about them these radical German philosophers like Hegel and Nietzsche like they seem to throw a gigantic wrench into the philosophical workings of the classical liberals like this this it's just like this almost like let's deconstruct everything and strip away everything. What are you going to do now? Classical liberals. <laughs> Ooh, Hegel. Uh, what did he want? Did he want like a monarchy or Hegel essentially was, um, he essentially didn't really advocate a specific type of government. He was more, he was, or like a specific ideology. He was more just trying to understand how, Explain and explaining how history can be explained through dialectic and spirit. That you know, these the history is sort of a it's it's history is the process of disseminating idea against idea, thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. In his time, circa the early 19th century, he believed that uh, the Kingdom of Prussia was the most advanced state at the time, that it had essentially managed to, it was the most efficient and best way to govern society at the time. Um, of course, he might, of course, I will admit he probably, one of the reasons he might have been encouraged to say that was the fact that he was, you know, a chair at the University of Berlin, a state run university by the Prussian government. But I think. For me, what he seems to understand things a little more broadly than I think a lot of the classical liberal philosophers like Thomas Paine, who I sort of utterly utterly detest, um, had where it's not about this one idea about how we're going to run government. It's more or about like because again, 
every government governments are appropriate and applicable to different types of societies where as you said like certain countries uh, like america you would say are much more uh they are much more amenable to republics than they would be a monarchy and that different types of governments are better for different times and i think he hegel would have said that essentially What's more important is the dissemination and history of ideas and how they form and shape history. Interesting. Someone says that they're a Nazbol. Oh, dear. Oh, I'm just thinking about government. I think government, um, I think government is more, more of a representative of what people think, how pe I think what people think, uh, what the proper just government is i think i think that's the uh thing i think government is more often than not like more of a, a reflection of human nature if anything else i mean i think ulysses s grant had a quote that i think there's probably a lot of truth to that every country has the every either every country yeah it's every country has the government it deserves and essentially and that more or less the society of an area of a uh, the structure and culture and all that of a society is going to either explicitly create the government that forms it or at the very least be very influential. Like even when you have foreign conquests, like when the Mongols invaded, you know, the steppes of Central Asia, which were predominantly Muslim, they didn't completely change the culture of like, the, you know, of the steppes. Rather, most of these Khans, like in what would form the Golden Horde, basically just became Muslim and adopted that culture and same thing in china when you had either you know either the mongol conquest of china or the the qing dynasty by the manchus were also a nomadic people in northeast china today um <clears throat> they essentially adopted the culture around them so saying that more often than not it seems the culture forms the government more than the other way around although i would say today with technology and the development of a centralized bureaucratic state that can change a little bit like nazi germany and soviet union absolutely were shaping the culture around them by just mass use of propaganda and and having totalitarian governments yeah oh uh, let's see so yeah uh, you mentioned why do you despise thomas Paine? anyway well i read his um big first off because you know i think he was completely wrong about human i think he was completely wrong about human nature i think he seems like he took a much more rousseauian approach and also just his vehement ardent anti-christian rhetoric especially in books like the age of reason which is it's like it forms the basis for the new atheists if you if you've read thomas Paine, you know and you listen you know anything like um christopher hitchens or any of the new atheists are going to say because it's all just it's a horrible, horrible essay where it's just any any bit of the Bible that he thinks he that he slightly gets confused by, he says, "Well, this is just proof that uh, the entirety of the Bible and Christianity is wrong and terrible." And it's like, you know, even the other founding fathers hated him as well. Like, I think there was like a number. I know John Adams and I think also Ben Franklin and a number of others wrote like direct criticisms and direct like responses to the age of reason and only six people attended to his funeral because of how outspokenly anti-christian he was oh i guess mercer struggles right to call talents pains a cunt mm. <laughs> yes yeah and, and i think it's um and even the fact that like he was cheering on the you know stripping away of rights he was an ardent supporter of the french revolution and was ardently you know supporting the stripping away of like catholic priests uh, rights in France where it's like, okay, so, you know, you're supposed to be a champion of freedom, but you seem to be like dancing with glee as Catholic priests in France are being arrested, forcibly, you know, secularized, uh, imprisoned and, you know, deported. And ultimately a large, large number of them were, uh, executed. <laughs> yeah. Mm, this is where I dis. Uh sort of part ways on Jefferson on the French Revolution now. So I think I think Jefferson was somewhat fond with Thomas Paine or I mean I mean this is the thing. I think 
one thing you have to say about both the Enlightenment thinkers and the Founding Fathers is that they're not one blob. Like, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were vehemently, you know, were sort of famous for being very, for being uh, ideological enemies of each other. Well, they're, well, they're pretty good friends at the same time. Yeah, but, the, you know, in terms of ideas, like, there's a big range in terms of, like, the religious beliefs and, you know, Jefferson's more deism, you know, on the deism side and then um, George Washington and John Adams on the actual Christian side. Yeah. And even that the difference um, in political beliefs sort of formed the basis for, I think, wasn't it Jefferson formed the either the anti-federalists or the Democratic Republicans and John Adams and uh, John Adams forming the federalists? Anti-federalists, mm -hmm. Jefferson and yeah, John Adams. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen the miniseries of John Adams? I saw a busy piece of it. It's, and it's really stuff. good. It was really good. Hopefully someday I will watch the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. even then, I think, you know, you know, and I think the question I'd ask, because John Adams even put it uh, rightly, him and I think uh, he said something similar to what Edmund Burke said. Edmund Burke said, um, liberty doesn't exist in the absence of morality. And John Adams said our, like our constitution was explicitly meant for a moral and religious people. And the question I think if I'm going to grill the classical liberals on is if liberalism, if morality is necessary for a liberal society to exist, how do you form a more moral society? And yet still, you know, do you think, any amount of uh, individual liberty is going to have to be sacrificed in order to keep some of it in order for us to have a more moral society? Or is there a way you can do it without any sort of coercion? Well, I think they kind of need to pull a high act here saying that coercion is not really like an initiation of force, that kind of thing. Is like what? <clears throat> like Hayek, like Hayek, uh, F.A. Hayek, he was also mm -hmm. a... Catholic. He, yeah, he was the Austrian. Um, yeah, he was. He was. He was famous for opposing. Um, I'm actually sort of a fan of Hay of Hayek for opposing um, uh, Keynesianism. Oh right, Keynes. Um, not yeah. uh, not on his degeneracy, but on Hayek though. Mm -hmm. Hayek was a. I think Hayek was one of the early fusionists, like libertarianism and traditionalism. I think they sort of need a. I think they sort of need a reconcile that. Reconcile that. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately, like the question is, because I actually believe the me wanting to advance traditionalism or reactionary thought is not something I want to do through the state initially. I think it's something that I think has to be done culturally by, you know, possessing certain institutions. But for me, it's sort of this mindset that it's putting things into a correct, I guess, order in terms of uh, priorities is that. If you need a liberal, if you need a moral society for a liberal society, why is liberty still the predominant value that classical liberals hold, even if they agree that that morality has to come first in order for there to be liberty? Let's see. I think classical liberals were right to identify that freedom of the individual was a good start. Like, I mean, like a, a good starting point, but. But more, but um, later on, that was sort of. I think later on, I think the main problem is that they focus on the on the individual too much. That the much earlier classical liberal thinkers focus I ideas on the family and the community. But now, <laughs> since we live in an age of hyper individualism and consumerism, that's sort of breaking down the community, mm -hmm. the family anything else like we just live in this is basically in other words decadence that sort of sort of just brought this social order down mm -hmm. and i think again the that's the question is um <clears throat> even if you're gonna say if you're and i think this is where i this is where i part with the american conservative classical liberals like ben shapiro Stephen crowder all that is okay they understand at the very least that and will agree, you need to have morality in order to have a free society, but they will still prioritize liberty over having a moral society to the point where 
most of American conservatives are just completely with okay are going to be are increasingly okay with any sort of social with any sort of moral degeneracy or moral breakdown because when was the last time you heard a uh, American conservative speak out against gay marriage or divorce? You know, the, the only moral issue that they still seem to be holding on any ground on is abortion. And yet, you know, because I'm thinking in five years, you're going to at the next Republican convention or whenever it is, I would be surprised if we didn't see a trans a transgender person come on stage and say, you know, yes, I'm transgender but I'm also conservative. And that means I believe in limited government as strong military, even though I don't know how that works um, and low taxes. I'm like, well, that sounds pathetic and stupid. <laughs> like hey. it sounds, it sounds soulless to me. Hey, that's peak boomer. Cause I heard this for you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and I mean that this is why I would advocate for, and why I distanced myself from classical liberalism, because I think, I don't think you can have liberty as the highest value and have a free society in the end because liberty proceeds from morality. And so I think if we want to have a society that has a high level of individual freedom, we should understand why is it that Western European Christian societies were the ones even for, you know, were had centuries of tradition laid down for there to be liberal societies because even in the Middle Ages, I would probably argue that America, sorry, European Christians were more "quote unquote" free than either a lot of Europeans today or the other people in other parts of the world at that time. Because if if you look at it, if you're like just some farmer, let's say in Hungary in like 1300, the government, your interaction with the government is going to be almost non-existent. You're going to pay very very few taxes. You can pretty much just do whatever you want, so long as you're not like practicing witchcraft. Um, you just do your farm work. You you're part of your local community, and you go to church. Your interaction, like even then, the, our modern this is all based on our modern concept of the state, which didn't come around until the essentially the uh, 17th century, where you had you know with the rise of absolutist governments like Louis the Fourteenth France. <clears throat> and I'm saying is I think we sort of I, th I would argue that classical liberals sort of have this um, have this understanding backwards where you know we need a free society that's part and parcel with a moral society. But the problem is that again, this moral they should understand that like these were the, there were moral societies that produced what they would understand as relatively free societies that had centuries without classical liberalism that you had people that would have been deeply moral and in a lot of ways free in medieval Europe. And in part, I think it's sort of this sort of, I know now because I've essentially become a traitor to the Protestant cause, but it's sort of that narrative that the bad, the big bad Catholic church oppressed everybody for a thousand years. But when I look at history, I don't really see that happening or at least anywhere near the extent that a lot of the alarmists like the Bounty Fathers would have said. Sorry, my, I have a very squeaky chair. <laughs> they, like, they seem like um, they need to have certain preconditions that liberalism needs to enter any type of free society, as you put it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, again, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm sort of pushing this. Is Would you still then consider liberty being the highest value or do you think that actually in order for a free society in order for people that want to value a free society they ought to actually shift their priorities towards morality rather than liberty first i i don't see i would not know i think well i think that morale i should say morality and liberty should be fused together to be honest that there's, I think classical liberals were able to create that fusion that one cannot live without the other. And now that now that's gone, now that fusion has been broken down, I think we're just seeing this totally degenerate society that we're living in right now. I, I mean, I, I think I can sort of see that because the way I see it, if the classical liberal movement in the late 18th and early 19th century um, <clears throat> You know, if it was just a way of 
clarifying or more uh, refining or specifying, giving a better definition towards the moral dignity that people were already supposed to have had during the middle and early Renaissance period, Middle Ages and Renaissance period that, you know, people, because a lot of this sort of comes from, you know, rights given to us by God. I think it's a descendant in terms of ideas from the deeply Catholic Christian idea of we are all created in God's image. And, you know, that's to me, um, as somebody becoming Catholic, that's something that's always like, it seems to be very much hammered home anytime I think uh, I talk to Catholics or hear Catholic arguments that that this dignity comes from the fact that we are in a sense sacred in a certain way that are that we're made in God's image that because of that we have a certain dignity that there are certain things that we cannot do to each other else they're you know not loving each other causing harm to each other is in a way blasphemous because we're hurting another human being made in God's image and we're denying their, we're denying them being made in his image. And I think that's where I think a lot of these ideas for rights come from. And again, there, I think you see a deeply moral and religious and spiritual um, basis, not a sort of secular philosophical one for rights. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm just saying is that, like, I don't hate a free society. I, I don't want a massive, like, you know, repressive government. I think, again, to an extent, have government repression certainly has issues, a lot of issues with it, and not least among that being the tendency towards, you know, uh, violating people's basic human dignity as an immoral act. But I think if classical liberals look at the society we live in now, I would argue that if they want a free society, they can't continue along the path of still trying to argue like we live in the 18th century, like we still have societies that could support classical liberalism. Because at this point, I think it's very obvious we don't, that America, Britain, Canada, the West is not a society that can support classical liberalism at this point because it does not have a moral compass. It doesn't even, because people, it's not, you. Imagine trying to convince people that God exists, which I think a lot of conservatives will argue is necessary to believe in rights, but trying to convince people that meaning exists when you have massively high suicide rates and you know people becoming school shooters and just generally increasingly sociopathic, selfish, and just wretched population living in the West. I think there needs to be a lot more work done that can't just be, we need more freedom, guys. <laughs> Just, uh, I just like I said earlier, I just think it's just stacking this, just stacking this, just just store of just breaking things down. And, um, mm -hmm. I just think the I just think the founding fathers will be so disgusted, but mm -hmm. what, what the system that they created has devolved into. Like, you know, American institutions are still pretty strong, but it's still it's just continually getting weaker by the day. And I mean, and again, that's the point, right? It's, um, <clears throat> it's. I, if I was a classical liberal, I'd under, I'd really try and figure out why did this happen, how did this happen, and what could be done. And again, the point is that I don't think that you can have a, that you can emphasize individual liberty as the primary goal anymore, because if you want liberty, you need morality, and we don't have morality. I and I. Go ahead. Well, to answer your like your first question, I think I think it was the death of God in the late nineteenth century that mm -hmm. sort of declared. I think that's mm -hmm. sort. Of, I think that's one of the causes that causes of that. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a question that all of us, I think, in the modern in the twenty first century, when all of this is um, <clears throat> culminating in the us asking the questions today, and it seems so many of the problems culminating of the 20th century culminating now in societal breakdown um, is the whole fact that Nietzsche, not so much his declaration was more of a prediction that I think society, Western society would reject God en masse and at, following the first world war. And, you know, 
it's this loss of meaning. It's this loss of there are things that are objectively true, good, and beautiful. And that can sort of explain moral relativism, uh, this, uh, the moral decay, and the fact that even look at the arts, the fact that we have this idea of um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And to a certain extent, if it's art in a lot of ways can be subjective, sure. But there's and so, there's now this concept that anything can be art. And if anything can be art, well, nothing can be art. It's why, you know, a box of used tissues is now worth $3 million. You know, it, it's, and this, these are the questions of meaning of recovering some sort of objective meaning that not just classic liberals, but everybody, I think we need to take seriously because this is where a lot of these problems are coming from is our society's acceptance of relativism over the past hundred years. Yeah. Also, also um, I like to move the conversation on like classical liberal theory, like the state of nature. Like, okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. And I think, because I think um, at this point, I've I've laid out my case and uh, strongly enough, and I think repeated myself enough. I think you you understand that, but um, yeah, I'd love to move on to that. Yeah, what's uh, what's what's what what do you believe is the state of nature? Um, I believe well, I believe, basically believe in the Christian understanding that mankind created perfect in God's image, but by our free will, we chose to fall and human history is I, i'm i'm very sympathetic to hobbes i think he's i don't go as far as him i don't believe in the absolute total depravity i do believe that humanity it's it's sort of it's a tragedy but with hope in it it's the fact that our history is very bleak but it's dotted with good in it that there were and not just you know in religion not just you know, um, the prophets of the Old Testament and, of course, culminating in the passion of Jesus Christ. But there are people that strove to be good and that we still live, though, in a largely fallen world. And ultimately, I think that because of this, I don't think we can trust individuals with a high degree of freedom without pushing it without a without it seems as was the case in europe centuries after centuries of you know christianity being baked very deeply into the culture and it's something and this actually goes along with them um, my last video was the second part on my history of prussia which is I, I almost argue prussia if britain was one country's was like um one way that a protestant country tried to develop a civilization, Prussia was the opposite in the way that if England's philosophy was based on Tom, on John Locke or Loki, I guess, uh, Prussia was based on Hobbes. Prussia sort of adopted Hobbes' ideology or philosophy because of all, because of the sheer hell that Brandenburg Prussia went through during the 30 years war. Like uh, you can watch the video yourself. And uh, I have a video where I just read uh, from the book, Iron Kingdom, about some of these atrocities that they were left understanding afterwards of both how do we of how do we prevent this from ever happening again from ever happening again and that being in its core both foreign invasion and this sort of almost psychopathic irrational violence that seems to be um, locked in mankind in a lot of ways that causes them not just to rape and plunder but just to murder like. In the Thirty Years' War, soldiers just, they, like, strip children naked and then drown them in a river for no reason. And it's like, how can you believe human nature is inherently good when people do that? And so, long story short, I believe that um, Hobbes was largely right on human nature, that it is inherently um, flawed. But I would give it, a, I would dial it back a little bit, that we have the capacity for good that we don't need a complete totalitarian government to rein us in, and that ultimately we were made for good. We were made for worship of God, but our own by our own choice, we are deeply fallen, and that by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, um, we can be redeemed and become better. If that's, is that a, a good enough explanation for you? Yeah, that's a very wonderful stay in nature theory. 
Thank you. I think my stay in nature is that my, um, the stay in nature is one of parasitism and that man- Of what? A parasitism that the stay in nature is naturally parasitic. That okay. human beings are more willing to lie, steal, plunder, and it takes a very long time to to be, to get away from that. To have to to form a civilized society. Mm -hmm. I, it took, it took I, I believe it took like a nearly a thousand years to get away from that state of nature. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, it, it's if you look at the history. Sorry, um, of the West of the past, you know, from the uh, from the end of the Roman Empire to the Enlightenment, it's you know, it took a very long time for Christian society to get rid of stuff like um, abortion and infanticide and slavery and um, a lot of just the really, you know, as a, as much as there was good in the pagan classical world, there were um, <clears throat> you know, so many terrible practices. Like, say what you want about the Middle Ages, but at the very least, if you were a child in the Middle Ages, you had a much better chance of survival because at the very least, you could reliably know that your father wasn't going to leave you, you know, on a mountainside to die because he, a medieval man, would have understood that to be a grossly horrible, awful thing to do. Whereas in the ancient world, that would have been seen as well. You have your, it's your right as the pater familias, and it's sort, you know, it's it's a it's a mercy to kill the child. Hmm, sounds similar. Sounds sounds familiar to something today, doesn't it? Uh, and kind of reminds me of Rothbard, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you there that it need that in order to sort of rein in this the immorality inherent in a lot of humans in humanity, you need a large. I wouldn't say you just need a state. You need some sort of restraint through a government, but you also you need morality. You need spirituality and a way to guide people because people won't choose to be good on their own. I don't think it's people are because as social creatures and as creatures that crave culture, culture and society are going to pull people towards one direction or another. Again, in 1950, you know, pretty much every all Americans were either Christian or Jewish would have gone to church and would have, you know, most of them would have had, would not have had children out of wedlock, would have thought abortion was terrible, would have been religious. Um, how did it yet? It only took a couple decades for that to completely collapse. And I think uh, not to repeat myself, but it's because of the, I would say the lack of a society that felt the need to enforce these morals. That so. just um like uh, also I like to de I like to go over like other classical liberal state of nature. Yeah, like, absolutely, absolutely. Like uh Rousseau, like Rousseau, like his famous decoration that um uh what was it that man is that man is born good but everywhere in chains. Is, yeah. Mankind is born free but everywhere he's in chains. I think it's like yeah Rousseau the guy who like cheated on his wife constantly and uh, abandoned his children. Wow, that sounds like Richard Spencer. Or Karl Marx. <laughs> like, um, like, yeah, Karl Marx was, uh, in terms of, I actually watched the uh, Stefan Molyneux video on him, and it's like, uh, yeah, Karl Marx was a, he was a dick. He was a terrible person. Oh, uh, that's this guy who read Marx. Um, well, at least Thomas saw Marxism. The guy, the guy is, uh, was, the guy was ironically a parasite of the working class. Yeah, role. he never earned any money for himself. Yes, and he I didn't even think, pay. He didn't even pay his maid. I don't think I don't. I don't, I don't think Marx was for sewing in any sense. No, no, I'm just saying in the sense of people that you know. Okay, they're trying to lay out a philosophy, yet, yet they were morally reprehensible people. I'm not asking for people to be perfect, but at the very least, like, don't be Rousseau or Karl, Karl Marx, but. I don't actually, I haven't read enough of Rousseau. I do know that he did have a sort of conversion experience at one point where he started believing that actually, like, uh, you know, a lot of his own ideas were wrong, that, like, uh, humanity needed God, that humanity needed, like, want, was going to crawl back and ask, like, for, uh, like, a, a strong dictator, a strong sort of handed government again. 
I think he was certainly wrong about the state of nature. I think, um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't know all that much about Rousseau. Well, my profile picture of Frederick Bastia at the law, like, well, he wrote the law and he criticized Rousseau and felt like he contradicted contradicted himself on his view on the human on his view of human nature. Mm -hmm. And also, what I heard about him, he gave a lot of. He gave his ideas of freedom is really borderline socialist. Who like, so? Yeah. Hmm. Like if you watch videos of Sargon of Akkad, um, who criticized Sargon of Akkad, like his many of his reasoning is borderline Rousseauian. Although I just think that's part. I think that's more a result of his environment that he lives in. Yeah, Br Sargon's like the most British person. He he well. He's an embodiment of a lot of like Britishness today. Some good, some bad. Like, um, but like, uh, any more about Rousseau? Because I'm, you know, I, I don't want to just lecture you. I want you to maybe teach me and teach the uh, the listeners. Do you know anything more about Rousseau? Or actually, tell me more about Frederick. I have not. I've never actually heard of uh, Bastiat. Oh, Frederick Bastiat, very interesting fellow. Yes, uh, please tell me. He was a French. He was a French classical liberal. He he was a French economist. He famed, he satirically he also was a also he was a fanatic free trader. And he also he wrote a pamphlet called the Candlestick Petition. And basically we need to block out the sun to protect the candlestick makers from competition that that's kind of hilarious. He was a very friendly guy. And the law. The law is like one of Ron Paul's favorite book, uh, books about liberty. Okay. At, in the in the first very passages of the law, he said the law is the gift from God, and the God gave us faculties to, uh, to uh, to accumulate capital essentially, and that that if and um essentially essentially when the law is pump becomes perverted, basically he was arguing against wealth redistribution. It becomes legal plunder. So he seems like he would have been like a proto libertarian then. Oh yeah, uh, uh, actually he was honestly. He sounds. He seems then like it seems more like than a English classical liberal than a French one. Yeah, that's sort of like one of the more unique things about him that mm -hmm. he like he did believe in God. After mm -hmm. all, he, he did declare that the law is the gift from God that he gave a fac faculties to the live other things. Also, he says some rather. Interesting, too. I mean, it's been said ahead. that the United States kept the law in its proper domains. That I would say the crux of Bastiat's personal philosophy. He did, he did definitely believe in property. That okay. was kind of his crux of mm -hmm. ideology. I mean, it, it's something that I've thought about. And uh, do you know the channel, The Distributist? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he doesn't like people asking about distributism, even though that's his channel name, because he doesn't think it's really applicable now. But I would say that, I mean, of any of, of all the classical liberal principles, I actually would say the one I ardently, completely wholeheartedly agree with is that we sh ought to have a fundamental right to own property, to own things. Because I think just, if I just think about the alternative of any idea where it's like, First off, I think Aristotle said like things held in common are not taken care of. Like there is a great video Sargon has on the Thinkery called um, "Anarcho Communism in Action," where there's a little um, enclave, a tiny little like abandoned military outpost in southern in the in the California desert that like a couple hundred just complete deadbeats live there and live off of welfare, and it looks like a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Like it's just completely filled with junk. Like everything's like people are constantly getting stolen from, and like the art there is, of course, just like broken bottles and like buttons, you know, welded to a bus that doesn't even work anymore. And uh, it's that's just not like peak anarchism. It is, and it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that that is. Mad. This is this is what this is what uh, s human humans humans because I'm an alien have been doing been trying to avoid for thousands of years of we don't want to do this anymore we want a state but it's like people 
owning things immediately get it's it's interesting i've heard like a couple arguments that one way you could solve overfishing is to privatize the oceans because currently like the ocean fishing water it's like okay you're in you're an american you're in american fishing waters you can essentially just fish as much as you want and then you but you don't own that fishing ground and so you don't really care about what happens to it and so once it's depleted well you just go to another place whereas if essentially you just you could like purchase like a couple of square kilometers of you know of ocean you'd be like okay so this is mine um i want to make it so that there's a sustainable level of fish here so i can continue to profit off of it because i can't use anybody else's as far uh, ocean uh, ocean the same thing has been proposed of like save like the manatees or something like that where like um there's a good reason why cows and sheep and pigs are not uh endangered because well, they're farmed and they're owned by private property. Like, like I think um, Lindy Beige, that channel, like he suggested, if we figured out a way to like convince people to uh, start eating um, and farming manatees, well, we could save it because you could just have manatee farms where they just breed lots and lots of manatees. But in that case, I'm thinking the free market in terms of ownership of private property is an is an incredibly good idea and one that I would fully support. <clears throat> You can't. You cannot have any real free society without any type of property rights. Yeah, and again, looking at the society where it's like we're going to hold things in common. Oh, what a nightmare they turn into. <laughs> oh man, I don't want to live in the Soviet Union or places like Mao's China. Mm -hmm. I Even I in China at all. And the thing is, like the Middle Ages, that was property was king in the Middle Ages, where it's like or property and titles, where it's like. Even in the early Middle Ages, before you essentially had the market revolution reintroduce currency into the West, um, once because you know there was the breakdown of trade and uh, flow of currency after the fall of Rome, you had the you, uh, you know kings and uh, uh, dukes and uh, you know aristoc the aristocracy that took over. They essentially exchanged people. Uh, they had the benefit system where people would you would say you have this title you'll do this for me and you can have this land and it, that was essentially the economic system for hundreds of years until slowly the market system started reintroducing just actual currency into the uh into the economy hmm. people i'm trying to say it's like the middle ages people really people really don't like uh, give it enough respect for the fact that it was a you know the period from like 1080 to 1500 was and was not the dark ages it was not cultural like regression and degeneration no you ha that's when you had the great cathedrals when you had you know beautiful manuscripts and great you know uh, advances in metallurgy and armor happening uh, and again it's part of this fact that a lot of i think a lot of the enlightenment thinkers said we want to completely sweep any good things that happened in the middle ages under the rug because we can't take credit for that we want to get we want to be able to skip straight from you know the ancient uh philo the ancient greek and roman philosophers like the ancient ancient democracy of athens and republic of rome all the way to us we don't want to pretend we want to pretend like anything in between none of that ever happened or if it did it was all evil <laughs> oh also have you ever read hapa or his book democracy the god that failed no i've heard it is a good book though very, very... He advocates for monarchy in certain ways, doesn't he? Uh, he's not a monarchist, but he just sort of realized that compared to democracy and monarchism, the monarchy is mm -hmm. definitely like, I think he is the, um, he is the uh, expression or he used the, the comparison that, like, of course, in his lovely German accent, if I have a, you know, if I own a house, I want to ensure and preserve it to give it, and you know, I want to take care of it because it's mine. I had the incentive, and I want to give it to my children. So I want to make it more valuable, so my children can have more. Whereas if I rent it, well, I have the now incentive to loot and take from it as much as possible, and zero incentive to take care of it. And essentially, he says that's the difference between inheriting government and elections. Like that's the that's the per actually that's that's pretty much his arg one of his arguments against democracy. Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking that's maybe that's a case against term. Maybe that's a case f against having term limits because if you make the position more temporary, then the people occupying it have less of an incentive to actually care about what they're doing. Because well, if I'm only going to be here for four years, then whatever. <laughs> 
Well, it wouldn't be a case for like longer term limits, though. I suppose. I mean, uh, we don't currently. Congress doesn't have term limits, so you can have people that are, uh, you that are apparently still like a Louis Slaughter in the state of New York where I live. Like she recently died, and oh. she was like like eighty or ninety years old. <laughs> Like she was still serving for like decade after decade, but yes, um, she was a good congresswoman. No, she's evil. She was pro-choice. Oh, I'm a I'm a I'm a concern. I'm well, I'm not concerned. I'm I'm a right winger living in New York State. It's a nightmare. It can't be that bad. Well, I live in upstate New York, where a lot more conservative here. It's just the fact that anything we want is canceled out by um by New York City. Oh right. Like if you look at most election maps, upstate New York, it's a bit mixed. But like, uh, if we were our own state, we would probably either be a swing state or a Republican state. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else? We can wrap up uh, soon. I think this has been a good length. Um, anything else you want to talk about, though? Because I don't want to keep this uh, too long. Also, why, why, why are you so from the Prussian monarchy anyway? Oh boy, everybody asks this. Um. Well. Can you... No, it's a fair question. Certainly, I'm, I'm happy to answer. It's oh, let me ask, a... let me ask you like a more specific question. Can you tell me anything unique about the the bureaucracy in the Prussian government? Because I heard that was very meritocratic. Um, yeah, I would say this is that the the reason to start off the reason why I find Prussia so fascinating is if come from when I read Christopher Clark's book Iron Kingdom, which is a history of Prussia. And I thought just like the intelligence and skill that the people that were governing Brandenburg and Prussia had that, you know, Brandenburg starts out as this very small little German state, you know, moderately sized German state um, in a sandy, swampy, barren wasteland in the 1400s. And just through careful leadership, they managed to get it to grow and grow and grow until it's comprising 60% of by the time of unification, it comprises 60% of Germany's population and land. Um, and it, pretty much almost all of Northern Germany. And it's like, why is it that Prussia, that that Prussia grew that large? Well, as you know, a state that was substantially richer to the South of them directly Saxony, you know, didn't. And it seems to me it's because they had this sort of under, they had this incredible foresight and understanding that, we can grow and we can improve upon land and develop and become more efficient. And they said, well, and because of our location with no natural defendable borders and because of the aftermath of the 30 years war, we have to basically be uh, come as efficient and, you know, militarily strong as we possibly can. And they did it. And essentially for 300 years, they managed to survive and unified Germany, which nobody was able to do out, you know, other than them. Oh, that's and not... that's why, and that's why I find it so interesting. Like they're not, they're certainly not the one thing you could say is they're not the biggest cultural. Uh, they were never the biggest cultural producers. I mean, they had people in terms of science and philosophy. They had, of course, Immanuel Kant and later Hegel, and they also had, um, and then like yeah, they had think in science the Humboldt brothers, Alexander and Wilhelm von Humboldt. Um, but like, uh, they, they're not like, they're not, they can't claim like being the home of Bach or Beethoven or Mozart, certainly. But I know just something about the, the fact that they just said, we're going to create a state from, you know, almost nothing. And considering what they build is really, I'd say inspiring. Yeah. That's interesting. I see. I don't really study empires that much so mm -hmm. if i was to study empires i'd probably study the austrian empire austrian empire is utterly fascinating it, it's like it, it was a fluke of history that because the holy roman empire was never able to become unified like a country like france was because of largely the Protestant reformation and then fully after the 30 years war austria which was you know the seat of the holy roman empire uh, emperor um and had the largest, most amount of land for the longest time until Prussia defeated them in 1866. Like, they're like basically stuck with, we want to be Germany, but we can't because, because of the, you know, Protestantism and all the, the ma major conflicts. So we're sort of just stuck with Austria, which is German, 
uh, Bohemia, which had a large German population, but lost mostly Czech, Slovakia, Hungary, Transylvania, and like a huge amount in like Central Europe of people that weren't German. And so eventually once nationalism became a more prominent idea after Napoleon, the only, literally, I think from 1848 to 1916, the only per there was only the only reason the empire stayed together was uh, Franz Josef because he just became so respected for having been on the throne for so long. <laughs> the reason why I'm somewhat interested in the Austrian Empire is it produced like one of like a lot of great thinkers I really like, like Ludwig von Mises, F. A. Hayek, basically, mm -hmm. basically the Austrian school of economics, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, Austria is a love. I, I I would love to visit Austria. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, I mean, Vienna seems like a beautiful city. Of course, it produced Mozart, who is not my favorite composer, but he und he undoubtedly you know contributed a huge amount to the development of music. Yeah. Um, I would say, yeah, empire wise is because when if we can go, is there anything else you want to ask me though about classical liberalism? We can talk about. That's, well. Out of the founding fathers, which one you probably identify the most with? Um, that's a good question. I would probably say, well, I'm not gonna. I don't want to reveal my actual last name here, but I am, I am related to one of the to one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So I guess by pure virtue of you know by default by my blood relation, that one of the signers. But of the ones that are actually known, um, I'd probably say John Adams. John Adams, that's, a, that's an interesting choice. Because mm -hmm. he seemed to be about the most conservative of them. Oh, I guess Jefferson was more... Jefferson was probably the most libertarian out of the time. Yeah, and then, you know, Ben Franklin was sort of... I just see him as just sort of this crazy dreamer. Like, um, like it, not in a bad way, but he was just... It, it's like it, Washington was the sort of... um, He was the sort of just stern paternal... You know, he was the general... Um, Jefferson was the thing with the political Je Jefferson was like the, the political radical Franklin was the scient was the crazy scientist. And I think Adams was, he was a lawyer. He was like, just, he was just the, by the books conservative of the group. I think I probably labor Jefferson as more of a philosopher. He was, he was, I was expecting, I was expecting someone like James Madison or Hamilton. I don't know. No. Fuck James. Fuck uh, uh, Hamilton. No national banks. <laughs> um, I, I mean, yeah, that, that was the best thing that uh, Andrew Jackson did. <laughs> yeah, just. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like James Madison is off. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know enough about him, though. Um, other than that, because I would think the interesting thing that the more secular classical liberals should look at is the fact that the deism of the founding fathers era really started melting away in the 19th century, specifically first off more predominantly in Europe where after Napoleon was uh, fell in Britain, especially you had a return of traditional nominal Christianity and deism was on a sharp decline in America. You had the second great awakening, which you had the start of the evangelical movement. And again, that was a return to traditional Christianity and eventually the Catholics came in with um, Pope Leo the 13th and the round would have been considered the third great awakening to address a lot of the issues of the industrial revolution. And the point being that the secular Thomas Paine dream of a post-Christian 19th century never really came to fruition. Of course it came now, but I think in a way Thomas Paine would even think was hor was horrifying. <clears throat> yeah. But I think we can go on until uh, seven, because so about ten more minutes. Um, so anything else you want to talk about, so we can wrap up? Yeah, just um, I guess that's the final topic is that what can the what what um you think there's a chance of returning to turning to that point of time uh, 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 that classical liberals would have wanted? Like you think there's or there's no point of return? No, I would say there's no point of returning to the way to exactly the way things were in the 18th and 19th century. History doesn't work like that. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not a progressive. I don't believe history. I, I don't believe history automatically progresses progresses in a good direction. Certainly, I don't even think Hegel believed that. He just believed that history was a was the story of just changes and different and you know the 
dissemination of ideas. I would say that, again, if classical liberals wanted a society, if their goal, I think that's the problem, is that their goal, much like uh, me as a traditionalist, my goal is not to make everything the way it was in 1400. My way is, my goal is to try and reinstitute certain moral structures that have existed in the West in the hopes of leading to a more moral and Christian society. I think classical liberals will probably do well to have a similar approach of don't want to make things the way they were. Try and understand why did you love those period at that period and those people and understand why did those ex ideas exist in the first place. And I would say because they existed in societies that were very, very moral and very, very Christian. And so I think in a culture war, in a cultural, um, it, 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 as we engage in cultural discourse, um, if we try and strive to uh, re-Christianize the West, which I think the West as it stands right now is, di is its days are numbered. The whole system that we live in is going to come crashing down, I would say, in the next within the next century, certainly. The point is, what society can be built? Um, what society and what can be built and salvaged from our Western society that we can build after the collapse? And that's essentially the project I'm trying to undertake is, especially now as becoming a Catholic, is trying to do what the Catholic Church tried to do in the aftermath of Rome of trying to establish some sort of stable Christendom. Well, um, that's that's a very interesting answer. I guess for me is that I'm just trying to figure out. By I used to be an anarcho capitalist, and I just sort of realized that yeah, that's not really practical. But I, I, I took my I, I flipped the anarcho capitalist flag upside down, and it's now the Austrian imperial one. I, I never had an an ancap flag. I have an Austrian one, but I was thinking about myself mentally of when I used to like have a few. Um, I used to be somewhat sympathetic, but then I'm like, no, no, I don't want to legalize child slavery. <laughs> yeah, well, at least you don't want to, at least uh, their ideologies. Well, kind of ridiculous at times, but they do make good points. Anarcho the thing is, it, it's like they're they're lucky that anarcho capitalism it, it was started now rather than a hundred year, hundred and fifteen years ago, because hundred you know in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, people would have looked at anarchists the way we look at Muslim terrorists. Like they anarchists blew up like constant like they they constantly were committing terrorist attacks. They murdered the president of France. They murdered one of our presidents. They killed the Tsar of Russia. <laughs> like there there were people that like, you know, they were an actual threat to society. <laughs> They're uh, not like LARPers that say, let's legalize weed and child sex. <laughs> this like I think, uh, I think uh, I think what I'm trying to do is that try. I'm just trying to figure out why the West is definitely unique compared to other civilizations. Jesus, <laughs> why? Well, why you say that? Well, I mean, I would. I, I mean, I think undoubtedly Christianity. I would say the West is a combination. First off, I'd say almost every civilization is distinct from another. Like. China is very distinct from Indian, which is very distinct from Mesoamerican. I think it's trying to understand why we think that the West is the best. And I think it's because of its combination of like 80% Christianity and 20% Greek philosophy. Yeah, so I'm just like, in other words, I'm just trying to figure out is why that, why we're able to achieve like this type of market economy that how we're able to achieve this type of trust in our society that's why i'm trying to figure out that trust is sort of a big factor of a like functioning and healthy market capitalism mm -hmm. that's a good point of the fact that the west developed helped develop very high trust societies and of course if you can trust the person you're trading with you're going to be much more willing to trade with them and more trade is generally good for the economy yeah um and i think it's it's partial it's much more i think one thing i would say i would argue about what the alt right is is the fact that you know if they believe that the genetics affect culture, I would say culture also affects genetics in the sense that 
one argument I would use, a theory I have as to why Western civilization uh, did so well is why it was able to produce so many talented individuals is because of the family structure, wherein in the middle, because the West as Christ, as being Christian under Christian sexual morals said that you have to be monogamous. So no polygamy, you can, you, and men have to stay with their wives marriages for life. So you can't divorce um, and you can't have incest. It led to basically, first off you have, twice the income and twice the ability to, and unlike having single mothers like we have now unfortunately in our culture uh you have twice the income you have kids being raised by both parents uh and you don't have polygamy so you don't ha you don't have you don't have polygamy so you have a much more so you have a situation which a lot more of the gene pool is able to reproduce so you have a lot more genetic diversity and you don't ha and you have a strong taboo against incest which Unlike in the Middle East, where uh, cousin marriage and polygamy were okay, you just had a lot less, I think, uh, genetic issues in the West. Outside of, of course, uh, royalty, which did get really fucked up by incest. <laughs> just, I just figure that. I just think about where I. Um, I just think it's just due to like just a thousand years of violence, kind of. Well, at least in the. <laughs> At least in the Anglo Saxon world, that it was I mean, just like basically heavy violence till it got to the point that this is this is a high trust society. Like high trust capital just takes centuries to develop. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm thinking that as well. I mean that that could also be the fact that um, I mean the, I think it's an argument that Hans Hermann Hoppe set argued as to why Germany was a more, had a much stronger economy than France even though is because Germany was deunified for a lot longer, unlike France, where in France, you basically had it, everything became centralized in Paris, like the universities, museums, uh, and all of that. Whereas in Germany, there was lots of competition between like, you know, Berlin, Munich, Frankfurt, Cologne, Hamburg, all wanted the best, uh, the opera houses, theaters, all that. And you had a much more sort of dynamic uh, culture and economy in Germany. Yeah, and that explains why the German people is is very industrial, very industrial. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think um, you could also sort of broaden that to the West, where Europe was always very deunified. Like every after Rome, every attempt to unify Europe under one banner has consistently failed. And even the EU, I think the EU is eventually going to fail. Um, you have that compared to China, which was completely unified. So there was, it didn't really have any internal um, uh, competition with itself other than uh, every few centuries, a new dynasty would come in and completely collapse the old order. It's one of the reasons why weapons development became so advanced in Europe because they were so constantly fighting each other. Uh, you had to have, okay, better armor. We need thicker, better armor to protect against bigger and bigger weapons. And you sort of had the cycle where by, thank goodness, gunpowder uh, was introduced because weapons and armor at the time of the late Renaissance was getting absurd. Like, like 100 or 150 pound full plate mail and like these massive swords that were like six feet long and these giant maces. Uh, it's like, okay, we need, it's like, I, I, I was, I would think they would have been afraid to like keep pushing it further and further where it's like, what are we going to wear? Like 500 pounds of armor and have to like attack each other with giant wrecking balls. Oh, it'd be funny to watch. Oh yeah. That's why it's like, you saw rapidly after the development of uh, gunpowder that they just stopped wearing armor. Yeah. I think that was sort of. And so I think, yeah, the, the competition, I think again, certainly the West development, it's due to a number of factors, but I think, Certainly three of them, I would say, would be the competition between nation states in Europe, um, the Judeo, the Christian and Greek uh, sort of moral and phil philosophical heart, and the uh, the uh, superior family structure in the West. <clears throat> also, I'd like to say that I think Judaism is, is total cancer. To what is? Judaism. G Gee, you're, wow. Well, I'm not, I'm not anti-Semite. No, just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking that's, that's quite, why do I keep getting people, I'm trying to keep my streams monetized, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I didn't say anything. I, didn't black black say anything. I brought in the black guy, YouTube. You can't demonetize that. That's racist. <laughs> But but, I don't um, black guy, so yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking, um, I mean, I'm part Italian, so I guess I'm black as well. <laughs> eh, eh. But I, I would say this is that, like, the problem of the problem of Judaism is like, is like, I, I would imagine the Jewish religion now is almost completely and totally different than the Judaism of the Old Testament. <laughs> oh, I just, I just, but, I just, I just find them to be. Cancer. Yeah, I, yes, thank you, Professor Farnsworth. I will never escape the alt right, even when I'm talking to a black guy. Wait, but, wait, wait. It's not an alt right talking point. It just. I know, I know. I'm just j joking. But I, I love that this is where we end it. I had a really good conversation. We should do it again. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, any, any, last, uh, any last words, Mr. Bond? Okay. Um. The law is perverted, and we need to do everything we can to save the West from itself. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, this is the end of the podcast. Have a nice day. Uh, oh, wait. Stop.